Recording in progress. So good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Murphy. I'm Vice President for Government Relations and Community Engagement here at Georgetown University. And on behalf of Georgetown, I'm delighted to welcome you to today, today's event, Democratizing Democracy, the Impact of DC's Public Campaign Financing Program and the Future of DC Elections. Now, if as they say in both politics and life, timing is everything, I think it's fair to say that given all the announcements this week in the DC political world, our topic today really hits the jackpot. As I'm sure you know, earlier this week, DC Attorney General Carr Racine announced he will not seek re-election and will not run for mayor as many had expected. At large, council member Robert White launched his own candidacy for mayor and declared himself DC's first ever fair choice mayoral candidate. Word eight, council member Treyon White seemed to announce this week he's also getting into the mayor's race we're expecting an announcement from Ward 5 Council Member Kenyon McDuffie about his future plans any day now. And of course, all these announcements spotlight perhaps the most watched decision in DC politics, will Mayor Bowser run for a third term? So today is a particularly interesting moment to help kick off election season in the district leading up to the June 2022 primary. Now, first, a quick note about our event today. Our policy forum, which is co-presented by Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy, is one in a series of DC-focused public policy briefings that Georgetown launched back in 2015 as part of our DC Public Policy Initiative. Through the initiative, Georgetown seeks to better connect the university's public policy expertise with issues important to the District of Columbia, which we have been proud to call home for more than 230 years. Previous events have explored a wide variety of topics, ranging from trends in the DC eviction system to the effectiveness of DC public schools human capital reforms, to how Uber treats its DC drivers, and to the state of African Americans in DC, which found shocking disparities in health, income, housing, job readiness, and even life expectancy. Now, the important report being released today, expanding donor participation in the district, authored by Georgetown sociologist, Professor Brian McCabe, along with Georgetown student, Kenan Dogan, is one of the first reports to explore how the district's new program of public campaign financing worked in its first election cycle in 2020. The report also makes key recommendations for reforms the council should consider to help the program better achieve its original aims. Now, here's how today's program will flow. In just a moment, moment, I will turn it over to our remarkable Dean of the McCourt School of Public Policy, Maria Canchon, to offer some opening remarks. Then Professor McCabe will present a summary of the report. Then we've put together a terrific panel of real experts and practitioners in DC elections and election reforms nationally, who we expect will engage in a lively conversation about the impact of both public campaign financing, but also ranked choice voting which DC Council Member Christina Henderson, who we are honored to have with us today, is championing. And following the panel, we've reserved some time for audience questions. So please start thinking of yours and feel free to put them in the Zoom Q&A. And to moderate our panel, we have recruited a keen observer of DC politics from the Washington Post reporter, Michael Bryce Sadler. As you know, Michael covers local DC government and politics for the Post Metro desk, Originally from Baltimore, he joined the Post back in 2018 after graduating from the University of Maryland. Before moving to local politics, Michael covered national and breaking news on the Post general assignment desk. But as we've seen in his reporting, he's quickly taken to DC and we are all, all benefiting from his talent. But before we get to that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to McCourt School of Public Policy Dean, Maria Kanchen. Maria, take it away. Thank you, Chris, and thank all of you for joining us at this event, looking at the DC Public Campaign Finance Program and the impact that it may have on the future of elections here in the district. I just wanted to take a moment to build on what Chris said about Georgetown's commitment to the DC community. The McCourt School shares this commitment to our hometown. In addition to Brian's new work, I'm excited to share a few other brief updates about DC-focused pro projects and partnerships the McCourt community is engaged in. 
They include our policy innovation lab, who work to advance racial equity and human-centered policy design with residents and community leaders in the 7th and 8th Ward. Data-focused projects, including the work of Massive Data Institute researcher Maria Alva, who studied the DC Flexible Rent Subsidy Program and found the success of this pilot program decreased the need um, for other homeless support programs in the district. And the new McCourt DC Council Pol Public Policy Internship, which this year supports four McCourt students, um, internships with the DC City Council serving residents of the district. And of course, we recently broke ground on our new building on Georgetown's Capitol campus and look forward to our move across town in a few short years. This move will allow us to deepen and to expand our work in and with the DC community. I'm excited to turn it over to Brian and his research partner, Kenan, who will give us a closer look at the results of their report. Brian? Great, thanks very much, Maria. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to get us started here. Um, let me begin by thanking Chris Murphy and Heidi Sue in the Office of Community Engagement here at Georgetown for putting this together. And thank Dean Kanchin and the terrific team at the McCourt School of Public Policy uh, for helping to highlight our research and its impact in the city. So today I wanna to present some key findings before we get into the panel discussion from our new report on expanding donor participation in the district, an analysis of the FAIR elections program. So by way of quick background, um, in 2018, the council passed the FAIR Elections Act, uh, creating the FAIR Elections Program to transform the way that political campaigns are financed here in the district. Among the goals of the program, um, several key goals are first, to bolster the influence of small dollar donors, those giving smaller sums of money in local elections. Um, second, to foster interactions between candidates and their constituents as candidates go out and do their fundraising. And finally, to incentivize a more diverse slate of candidates to run for local office. With the Fair Elections Program, uh, the district joins a handful of other cities, including New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and about a dozen other ones, in providing public financing in municipal elections. Uh, the program began in the 2020 election cycle. So the report that I'll share today is on the inaugural implementation of the Fair Elections Program. Um, in 2020, there were 11 candidates in the at-large race who elected to participate in the, the public financing program. And there were 17 candidates in the ward race uh, who elected to participate in the program. So 28 candidates total took advantage of the Fair Elections Program. Um, three participating can candidates, including Council Member Henderson, uh, won their races. As Chris mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's a particularly opportune time to talk about the program, how it worked and how it could be improved because in 2020, candidates for mayor, attorney general, seven positions on the council and the state board of education will all be eligible to participate in fair elections financing. I wanna briefly share some background on the program and how it's run for those that are unfamiliar with the program and then we'll get into key findings from the report. So the Fair Elections Program is an optional public financing program for local candidates. Um, candidates can choose to run for election under the traditional financing system that we've had for a while, or uh, they can opt into the public financing program. Candidates qualify for the program by raising a baseline amount of money from a minimum number of donors in the district. So in 2020, at-large candidates uh, qualified by collecting $12,000 from 250 DC residents and ward candidates qualified by collecting $5,000 from 150 DC residents. After candidates qualify for the program, uh, they then receive a base, a base payment that provides seed money to begin their campaigns. Participating candidates in council races receive $40,000 base payment in 2020. Uh, participating candidates in the program agree to lower contribution limits than non-participating candidates. So in the at-large election, a candidate that did not participate was allowed to accept up to $1,000 from an individual donor, whereas a participating candidate was only allowed to accept $100 from, from an individual donor. In the ward races, it's $500 for non-participating candidates and $50 uh, for participating candidates. So these participating candidates accept lower contribution limits. And in return, their contributions uh, from district residents are matched uh, with public funds at a five to one ratio. So in other words, when a DC resident donates $10 to a qualified participating candidate, the Fair Elections Program provides an additional $50 in matching funds, thereby yielding the candidate $60 from that $10 donation. 
So I want to jump in and share some key findings from our report on the program. Um, the full report is available on the McCourt website, and there will be a link in the chat uh, for those that would like to take a closer look at the report. So one of the goals of the Fair Elections Program was to increase donor participation in financing municipal elections. And indeed, in 2020, we see the number of donors uh, giving to council candidates climbed pretty, pretty significantly. So in this graph, the, the light blue line shows the total number of donors to council candidates in each election cycle from 2008 through 2020. The purple line shows the number of donors in ward races, and the red line shows the number of donors in, at -lar in the at-large race. In 2020, uh, nearly 14,000 donors who live in Washington, D.C. contributed to a candidate. This is up from about 6,000 in previous election cycles. Now, I should note that 2020 was a unique election cycle, even beyond the inaugural fair elections program. There was an open seat in Ward 2, there was a competitive seat in Ward 4, and there was an open at-large seat. So um, we do see donors, the number of donors rising as a result of these factors in 2020. The other thing that I want to note, and it's not reflected in the chart, but I'll come back to it in my suggestions about the program, is that DC donors, donors who live in Washington, DC, comprise about 70% of donors in local elections, and the remaining 30% of donors uh, live outside of the districts. So it's not only that there were more donors in 2020, uh, there were also more donors who gave small sums of money to candidate. And this is one of the goals of the program, right? To encourage people who don't necessarily have large amounts of money to give to participate in the campaign finance system. So throughout the report, we refer to small dollar donors as anybody who gave $25 or less to a candidate. With the Fair Elections Program, the share of donors who contributed $25 or less climbed pretty significantly. In 2016, we can see that about 15% of donors in the at-large race and only about 10% of donors in the ward races were small dollar donors. However, in 2020, more than a quarter of all donors in both the at-large race and the ward elections were small dollar donors. So it does suggest that the program is succeeding in drawing Washingtonians who give $25 or less into the political system. Now, candidates who participated in the fair elections program relied more heavily on these small dollar donors than candidates who did not participate. In the donor coalitions that are assembled by candidates, this graph identifies the share of donors who gave $25 or less. In other words, of all of the donors to a candidate, what percentage of them were small dollar donors? So, and here the evidence is pretty clear. In both the ward and the at-large races, about 30% of all donors to fair elections candidates gave $25 or less. By contrast, only about 9% of donors to non-participating ward candidates and about 16% of donors to non-participating at-large candidates were small dollar donors. So quite starkly, this reveals that candidates who participated in the fair elections program assembled donor coalitions with a larger share of these small dollar donors. With more and more small dollar donors participating in the election, the average contribution size to a council candidate declined precipitously. So in 2018, you can see that um, in both the ward race and the at-large race, the average don donation was about $200. In 2020, the average contribution was about half that, closer to about $100 in both elections. The Fair Elections Program put candidates in a very good financial position, and especially in the at-large race. So in this chart, we show the average donation size in dark blue. If you look at the at-large candidates on the left side of your screen, you'll see that the average donation to a non-participating candidate was about $250, but the average donation to a participating candidate was about $63. However, this $63, when matched five to one through the program, actually yielded $378 to participating candidates. So this is substantially more than the average donation to a non-participating candidate in the at-large race. It suggests that the program is providing parity, especially in the at-large election, where there may actually be a financial advantage to candidates that are participating in the fair elections program. While the program succeeded in drawing donors into the system, uh, it did so very unevenly across the city. In our analysis, we find that candidates who participated in the program have a very different geography of donors than non-participating candidates. So this graph shows the share of donors to at-large races from each of the wards. And let me walk you through exactly what I'm, what I'm showing here. If you look at Ward 1, we learned that non-participating at-large candidates drew about 10% of their donors from Ward 1. That's the dark blue line associated with Ward 1 on the bottom left. 
By contrast, participating candidates drew about 20% of their donors from Ward 1. So um, we look across the city and we can see that the fair election candidates are drawing more donors from wards one, five, and six, and those that didn't participate in the fair elections program from wards two and three. Yet the major takeaway that I take from this analysis um, is that neither type of candidate, neither participating or non-participating candidates are attracting many donors from east of the river. Participating candidates did no better than non-participating candidates in attracting donors from ward seven and ward eight. So while the fair elections program has successfully drawn more donors into the system, it seems to have failed in doing so in neighborhoods east of the river. And finally, I wanna share a graph um, that looks specifically at the ward races and the candidates want running in the ward races to ask whether candidates in these races focus their fundraising efforts on constituents in their ward or whether they fanned out across the city um, uh, to collect donations. So this chart looks at the share of DC donors uh, to each ward candidate that lived in their district. And it's important because this tells us whether or not the program is pushing ward candidates to focus, focus their fundraising efforts locally. Now we found that donors living in a candidate's ward typically make up less than half of their total DC donors. So for each candidate, this graph shows the share of donors who live in their ward. The dotted gray line in the middle is 50%. So any bar that's above 50% shows that more than 50% of a candidate's donors live in that ward. And any bar below 50% that fewer than half of their donors live in their ward. For example, if you take uh, Brandon Todd and Janessi Lewis George in the middle, this tells us that slightly less than half of Todd's donors were from Ward 4 and slightly less than 40% of George's donors were from Ward 4. So for both of these candidates and almost every other candidate in, in ward elections in the 2020 cycle, their fundraising efforts relied on donors outside of the district. So with those findings, I wanna share four key policy recommendations that we make in the report, and then I'll turn it over to the panel for a discussion of the fair elections program and ranked choice voting. So first, as I showed you in the last chart, the program does not seem to incentivize ward candidates to raise money from within their districts. And this is potentially problematic because one of the goals of the program is to increase contact um, between candidates and the people that they represent. So one consideration is to create an ulterior alternative matching criteria for donors that come from within the candidate's ward, right? It could be an eight to one match for within ward donors and a five to one match for donors elsewhere in the districts. A second concern that we raise in our report is that donor participation rates in Ward 7 and Ward 8 remain exceedingly low relative to the rest of the city. One of the challenges of matching programs like the Fair Elections Program is that donors need to have a baseline amount of money to give um, in order for that donation to be matched. And so one of the things that we, we consider in the report is the adoption of a voucher program, a democracy voucher, a democracy dollar program that could potentially increase participation in those neighborhoods. Um, the best example of this currently is in Seattle. Um, Seattle is on its third election cycle of a program called the Democracy Voucher Program, where every, every voter in Seattle receives four $25 vouchers in the mail, and those uh, voters can then spend them on any local candidate of their choice. So this ensures that everybody uh, in the city has money to spend in local elections. The third issue I want to raise is that non-resident donors, in other words, people that don't live in Washington, D.C., comprise about 30 percent of all donors in the council elections. Um, Non-participating candidates relied more heavily on non-resident donors than participating candidates, but they still made up a significant share of donors in local elections. And so um, one of the recommendations is to think about ways that the council might incentivize candidates to refocus their fundraising efforts on people in the district, right, their constituents in the district. And finally, uh, to sort of wrap us up and bring us into the discussion, uh, one of the things that we've learned is that attracting more candidates to seek elective office um, is terrific. It encourages um, people who don't have you know, large networks of high dollar donors already um, to enter to seek elective office. It diversifies the donor pool. Um, it increases the number of people, the number of voices of candidates running. But it may also cause confusion among voters. Um, in 2020, there were 24 candidates who sought uh, the at-large seat on the city council. And you can imagine um, for sort of casual everyday voters in the district, trying to sort through the policy positions of 24 different candidates um, to understand 
uh, the different things that they stand for is actually um, very, very difficult. It may cause con confusion or fatigue among voters. And so one of the outcomes from our report is that the council should consider some alternative electoral systems that would create opportunities for voters to meaningfully participate in local elections in different ways. We highlight two in the report. Uh, one is ranked choice voting, which I hope we'll talk about today. And the second is a top two tier, a top two system where uh, an open primary occurs, and then the top two vote getters go on to the general election. So, with that, I'm going to pause on our our findings from the report, and I'd like to turn it over to Michael Bryce Sadler for for our discussion. Thanks so much, uh, Brian. That was a, a great segue into our esteemed panel to probe a bit further on some of these topics. Uh, so, we'll be joined by Professor McCabe as well as at-large council member Christina Henderson, who recently introduced legislation to implement ranked choice voting in the district and was also a victorious candidate last year uh, in the at-large race using DC's Fair Elections Program. Uh, we also have Professor Esther Fuchs, uh, Director of the Urban and Social Policy Program at Columbia University School of International Affairs. Uh, she's an expert on urban politics and a frequent consultant to government and political campaigns. And we also have with us Chuck Thies, a uh, political consultant with over 20 years of experience in DC elections. He's managed races for DC council, council chair and mayor. So uh, is pretty knowledgeable about elections as well. Um, so let's jump in to our questions, uh, starting with DC's public campaign financing program. And since we have limited time, I'm hoping we can keep this fast moving. And if anyone really wants to jump into a topic, you know, raise your hand and I'll try to get to you. Uh, and also as a reminder for audience members, you can post questions in the Q&A and we'll try to reserve time for that as well. So uh, Council Member Henderson, I'm hoping that we can start with you. When the council passed the law creating the Fair Elections Program in 2018, supporters said it had a number of goals that Professor McCabe went over, among them lowering barriers to entry into public office, incentivizing more diverse candidates to run, uh, increasing the influence of everyday residents in elections, and uh, primarily reducing the influence of deep-pocketed donors in elections. Uh, and as I mentioned, you were one of the first candidates to participate in this program, and you were among the first candidates to win using it. So would you say this program is achieving its goals? Um, I definitely would. And, and first, let me say thank you so much uh, to Georgetown and the McCourt School for having me. Um, it's great to be a part of this conversation. Um, but frankly, I probably would not have run for office, but for the fair elections program. Um, and you know, initially when um, my former boss reached out to me about potentially running for the seat, my first response was like, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> but a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was like, I'm not independently wealthy. A lot of my friends work in public service. Um, how could I possibly raise the amount of funds necessary to compete in a citywide race that would likely be an open seat? Um, and so without the fair elections program, I, I probably would not have um, thought to do it. The other thing too, for me, um, which was pretty unique was that I also wanted to try to figure out how I could continue my job in the Senate. And because I was choosing to do a small dollar program um, that was okay ethically because no one can make an argument that they gave me $100 to influence my then boss. Um, if you wanted to influence my then boss, who is now the majority leader, you needed to add some zeros um, potentially uh, to that contribution. Um, and so, you know, I was really excited about the opportunity to participate in the program. And it, it, it was full circle for me because I worked on an iteration of uh, the public financing bill um, back in 2013. And so it was great to see it pass. Thanks, council member. And I want to open this one up a bit, guess in terms of whether it's working as intended. Uh, so Chuck, what do you think? Would you agree with the council members points that uh, the goals are being met? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, myself. I thought you guys unmuted me. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I do agree. Uh, it's certainly um, uh, fulfilling a lot of the objectives, at least in part. Um, Christine is a perfect example. She says she wouldn't have run without it. Um, and, and I think if we look at the field of candidates that ran in 2020, um, literally dozens, uh, many wouldn't have run without it. Uh, it does beg the question, uh, is more better or is there a way that we can get better quality? Because there were a number of candidates that we wouldn't refer to as quality candidates. 
And that doesn't mean they're not good people. It just means they didn't have the qualifications to hold office, uh, many of whom didn't even have the ability to run good campaigns. Nonetheless, they were given money. So I, I think the program is working. Certainly, um, you know, we only have one cycle that we can look at to see how successful it was. Um, <clears throat> I advised a candidate, Vince Gray, who won re-election uh, in Ward 7. I advised him to not participate for a number of reasons, but one of them, and it wasn't a criticism of the program, uh, but one of them was that the program was just getting up and running. And we didn't know the extent to which we could rely on it, uh, not so much insofar as raising money is concerned, but there are issues in terms of cash flow issues and beginning your campaign relatively dead in the water because it can be a while before you get that first um, uh, matching fund uh, uh, transfer from the Office of Campaign Finance. So there are some issues that need to be worked out and uh, um, things like this will help I hope to resolve or at least advise the council with regard to how to tweak and improve the system. But as, as far as its, its original objectives, I think it's very successful. And I think a lot of candidates are happy that it exists. Michael, can I just jump in on, on one of Chuck's? Um, so, you know, I think that there are, what, one of the things that we find in the report are there are sort of two kinds of candidates that seem not to really benefit from public funding um, to the extent that that benefit means receiving more money, right? And, and one is a, a type of candidate that mostly has maxed out donors, right? And Vince Gray is a good example of this. Um, you know, the limit in the traditional system for ward candidates is $500. And I think about 40% of Gray's donors gave $500, right? Whereas in the, the public financing system, if you give $50 the max, it goes up to 300 with the match, right? So, so candidates that are relying on really wealthy donors or donors that are giving the maximum amount of money, uh, like Vince Gray, um, that, that sort of candidate doesn't benefit. And then the other sort of candidate that doesn't benefit is a candidate that relies on donors from outside of Washington, DC. And in this case, Brooke Pinto is a good example. Um, the majority of um, council member Pinto's donors came from outside of DC. And for, for a candidate like that, um, right, the, the limit applies. So the donors can only donate $50, but the match doesn't apply, right? So to the extent that you're relying on donors from outside of the city, um, it probably doesn't behoove you to, to join the fair elections program. That's a really interesting uh, point. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Um, and turning to you, Professor Fuchs, uh, you're a national expert on this topic. You've seen different public campaign financing models around the country. Is there anything that uh, Professor McCabe talked about in his report or uh, that you've observed about DC's experience uh, with, their first, with its first time in this program that surprised you or stood out? And can you talk about some of the perhaps unintended consequences we've gone over that maybe should be revisited? Well, first of all, congratulations to DC. I think uh, getting this kind of program started is an extraordinary uh, benefit to small D democracy, um, not just local democracy. I think you'll see <clears throat> you know, the glitches uh, gradually coming out of the program as, as it's implemented uh, over time. Um, there's, there's some things that can be learned from other uh, cities and other jurisdictions on this. I'll focus for a minute on New York um, because we have the council woman with us who's, who's also um, proposing a ranked choice voting. So matching funds is one part of, of a couple of things that can be done to really uh, improve engagement, increase diversity uh, among elected officials and really increased turnout, which is a huge problem for us now uh, all over the country, um, uh, particularly in local elections. Um, I mean, we were thrilled that in our last uh, dem primary, Democratic primary, we had a 23% turnout of, of voters, which was actually, we had uh, in the primary, which was the highest we've had in, in decades and decades. I mean, that's pretty pathetic when you think about it, but it was an improvement. So um, I would say just a couple of things quickly that um, I, I strongly support the idea of bringing in, bringing in ranked choice voting and adding it to your matching funds program. And I would also suggest term limits. Um, New York has done all three now. I don't think we do it all as successfully as we could and uh, just 
a uh, buyer beware, we just hit a, a really difficult glitch in the matching funds programs, which is the advent of political action committees in our local elections. So in the, particularly in the mayoral election, uh, as opposed to the city council races, we're all at large in New, we're all, excuse me, district, district based in New York. We got rid of our at large uh, seats quite some time ago. We actually had them. Most people don't know that, um, but um, the political action committees now are, oh God, they are um, proliferating. Almost every mayoral candidate had one. The public doesn't really know much about where that money is coming from and they blitz the airwaves with ads and they, and no one really understands that. Um, it turned out that, you know, in Bill de Blasio's first election years ago, there was a po political action committee supporting the carriage horses in Central Park, everybody thought, which turned out to be funded by a big real estate developer. So, you know, just uh, buyer beware on, on all of those things. I would say one thing that could be done that we do on council races, as I said, our district-based races is we have a minimum funds raised before you can get matching funds. So that deals with Chuck's issue about, it doesn't deal as much as I would like. I think it, it could be raised right now. It's only $5,000. And you also have to have to show 75 contributors from your district, which I also think that number could be raised. So I think rather than making something too complicated in different tiers of matching funds, that we should all be going for some baseline of minimum funds raised and number of contributors uh, of small dollar donations to the district before you're actually eligible. I think that would go, go a long way to getting people to focus more on their district. We created an eight to one match in New York for all of the, all of the folks running. Um, I have to say, I think it's too high, to be honest. I was, I was surprised because I normally uh, would have supported all of these, all of these trans, you know, changes in, in the election law. What happened when you combine it with ranked choice voting, we had a proliferation of candidates in the city council races, uh, averaging uh, seven candidates per race. I do a website called Who's on the Ballot, which just gives basic information about the election and candidates, all nonpartisan. I never had as many <laughs> requests, not just to my website, but personal requests to me. Like, how can I rank? So if you're going into the ranked choice voting world, which I really think is amazing, we, we blew it out of the water there and we'll come back to that later in terms of uh, the kinds of things we wanted to accomplish. You have to think about how it's gonna interact with the matching fund system. And the public just has a really hard time if you have open seats, which we do, do because of our term limits and you have mayor's races as well. Um, and we had other citywide ways, races, the controller and the public advocate. And then we had our borough presidents. People could not handle you know, seven to 10 candidates in a city council district and really understand too much about that. So those are a couple of things that I think, you know, to think about, because you will tweak this. It's, it's ongoing, which is all a good thing, but don't give up on it, even though, you know, in the first iteration, it probably doesn't achieve everything you want. Esther, can I can I can I speak to something you mentioned? Because it's I think it's very important. <clears throat> and you mentioned the proliferation of PACs. Um, and we also have to, when we're talking about PACs, talk about candidates uh, who can raise uh, extraordinary sums of money, whether at the ward level uh, or citywide here in DC. And it's very important uh, because the, the, um, the matching money more or less is capped. And in the mayor's race, <clears throat> excuse me, it's $5 million. But for example, in the ward and council chair races and the attorney general's race, um, based on all of this is based on the average amount, of, not the average amount of money, the money that the winning candidate spent in the previous cycle. Um, that needs to be fixed for several reasons, first of which is, is that's just a random number. I could win and not spend a lot of money. 
uh, because maybe my opponent who's been exactly is caught in a scandal five days before election day and they implode. And here I win with $60,000 and they spent 5 million. So unlikely to happen, but possible. But more importantly is a, a very good candidate that is taking public funds, but is being wildly outspent by uh, a candidate that who PACs are supporting or a candidate who's just raising ridiculous amounts of money through the traditional system. I believe in New York, they have a provision whereby if I'm being outspent, I can come to the uh, Office of Campaign Finance and say, I'm being blown out of the water by special interests or by this candidate. Can I get more money beyond that which I'm entitled to? And I believe the system sometimes grants candidates that money. Uh, well, the case, you're absolutely right. Just to yeah. say that the, thre the threshold of the amount that is going to be spent is, is determined in advance. And when, but if there is several candidates that are not in the system and raising a lot of outside money, that threshold gets raised right. so that we you can actually increase your amount of spending and increase your matching funds. Just to cheer everybody up a little, the person who spent the most money in the New York City mayoral race lost big time. So, uh, which was Ray McGuire. So this is, uh, um, and the person who won was in the matching fund system, Eric Adams, and who is, uh, who is African-American, who comes from Brooklyn. I mean, this is a big, you know, big transformation. And I, I believe that he definitely benefited from the matching fund system, as well as from ranked choice voting. It's no question about that. <laughs> and and PACs, but, but he I had a really... pack too. Look, once the packs are in there, you need a pack. But you but know, I think it's didn't... really important that DC you know the guy who has the father donate a million dollars. He did very badly. <laughs> it's very important in <laughs> DC if we're trying to level the playing field and bring good candidates into politics who can't necessarily raise money that we have a provision whereby those candidates can receive extra funding if they're being outspent. It's not in the code right now and it needs to be in it. You're, you're really, the PAC thing is really a game changer. You're absolutely right. We need to fix it in New York still also. It still, uh, I think, gives candidates uh, disproportionate influence in their ability to get to buy campaign ads. Frankly, that's the big thing. I'm going to um, I'm going to make sure we, we keep moving on some of these topics. Council Member Henderson, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in uh, on, on the discussion they were just having. No, I mean, I just wanted to say, I, in my particular race, I was outraised, um, I was outspent, and I was outendorsed. So um, those are things that <laughs> are elements, but they don't necessarily make up to, to winning um, campaigns. But go ahead, Michael, I know you wanted to keep the conversation going. No, it's okay. I actually was hoping that I could turn to Professor McCabe really quickly on, on fair elections before we move on to ranked choice voting. Um, I know this is something obviously you've been researching and watching, and I was curious to know what you'll be paying particular attention to in this next election cycle as we have a mayoral race, an attorney general's race, and a DC council chair race. Um, all these things are up for grabs. So what are you going to be looking at in terms of how fair elections comes into play? Yeah, great. Thanks, Michael. It's a great, it's a great question about what we should really be looking for here. Um, so I think the things that sort of really interest me moving forward, um, I'm interested in sort of the geography of donors, right, where we're raising money from. And, and in some ways, it's actually to me less about where the money comes from, and more about the, the sort of touch or the contact that candidates have with, um, with individuals across the city, right? One of the benefits of a program like this or, a, or any kind of public financing program is we expect that candidates will be spending their time talking to kind of everyday people, right? To raise money from everyday people rather than just relying on kind of a bunch of wealthy donors to fund their campaigns. And so I wanna know that candidates are going across the city, right? And going to different neighborhoods and talking to all sorts of people um, that we get those touch points between sort of candidates and constituents pretty early on. So um, that's one thing that I'll look for. I think the second thing that I'll look for is that uh, most incumbents in 2020 did not use the program, right? And that makes 
um, sense from a kind of political consulting perspective, right? They have uh, sort of larger networks of donors than newcomers to the political process. Um, but I'd like to see a program where everybody uses it, right? Where we sort of agree that this is the, the new system, um, where we agree that public financing is good for campaigns and elections. And so I'll be watching, right? I mean, there will be some, certainly some open seats, it sounds like the attorney general, um, the mayor's race, uh, Un unclear yet, um, but but a lot of the council seats will have incumbents that are running for re-election, and I'd like to see whether or not um, sort of they're using the program. And then I guess the third thing is I'd, I'd really like to see sort of um, more movement over time on really small dollar donors, right? Somebody that's just giving five or ten dollars um, that actually matters in this political system in a way it never has before, right? And I think that that um, not unlike our conversation about ranked choice voting. One of the real challenges for the fair elections program is to educate the public about why that matters, right? Historically, if I was going to give five bucks to Council Member Henderson, well, that, that doesn't really feel like, um, right, that's a huge influence. But now my five bucks becomes 30 or my 10 bucks becomes 60. And all of a sudden, I'm a little bit more of a, my voice is heard a little bit stronger. So, so sort of educating people that actually small donors um, really matter here. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Dr. Fuchs. Just a quick point on, on what Brian was saying um, about incumbency. I think that the impact of, of the uh, campaign finance laws is really diminished without term limits. The one thing in political science that we know and have done a lot of research on is incumbents have an extraordinary advantage in everything. And it's really hard to break through that. And when New York created uh, the term limits program, it was transformative in terms of changing who could run for public office and, and really increasing minority representation. So these things do work together. So I would urge if you're thinking about reforms, I know that is a difficult lift. Uh, it's something we did it, we did it through a proposition. Um, we tried that <laughs> in DC. <laughs> yeah, did not. Uh, it, it also was a vote of the of the voters, um, and then the council overturned it. They overturned it. Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, so yes. it was okay. tried, and then not happened. <laughs> I I, I want to I, I do want to weigh in on on one thing because I, I think it's important. Um, Brian, you you mentioned the multiplying factor. Um, to me. That is an extraordinary selling point when you're reaching out to potential donors. You know, you see campaigns do it right now. And of course, it's all malarkey. It's, it's, it's illegal for me uh, to actually match someone else's contribution uh, outside of the campaign finance system. But you see campaigns use it all the time. If you know, donate today, some, uh, someone else will match it. Um, completely illegal and malarkey. But my point is, uh, that's a good sales technique. And this is a great opportunity for grassroots campaigns as well as incumbents to reach out to their donors and say, you know, we're going to amplify your contribution five times. It's, it's, it, it can't be understated in terms of not just helping the campaigns fund themselves, but really getting everyday voters involved more in politics. Because one thing that I learned is that if you can get a, a voter to give you a dollar, they're bought in. They're engaged through to uh, when the votes are finally counted. Um, uh, they have an investment. And, and so if you can get them to give you 10 bucks and it turns out to be 60 bucks or whatever the math is, uh, you, have, you have an electorate that's just more bought in and engaged in the system. And that's one of the value added aspects of this entire program. I think Chuck is exactly right. And in terms of just to add to something that Brian said around uh, things to look for. So number one, how is this work outside of a presidential election year, um, where we're in DC for a lot of our folks who are politically engaged or who are donors, there was a lot of, I would say, donor or donation fatigue in terms of asking for 250, 1,000, 1,500. So when I come along and say, well, you can max out for 100, they're like, oh, perfect. You know, that's that seems small. But I think to also Chuck's point around um, that was most certainly part of our pitch around give what you can, because this was also during the pandemic. So that's another thing, right? How we rolled out this new fair elections program in the middle of a pandemic where face-to-face um, -face interactions with uh, voters was very limited in terms of stay-at-home orders and those kinds of things. And so how do you communicate with folks um, 
in a virtual environment, but also, um, you know, they may not necessarily be inclined to give you the max, but they'll say, oh, okay, if I give you $25, that actually, I'm contributing, I'm helping, I'm going further in the way. And I think that um, definitely helped a lot of people as well. So the two things I would watch this year, are one, how is, don how is giving in a non-presidential year, but then also, I mean, we're technically still in a pandemic, but how does this, uh, how does the program work out where you have the ability of candidates to do more face-to-face -face interactions um, with, with voters? And hopefully this panel helps continue to increase that education on this program. Uh, I'm gonna keep us moving just so we can make sure we have time to talk about ranked choice voting because that's something uh, a lot of you mentioned earlier. And actually I'm gonna stick with you, Council Member Henderson. I'm hoping for those who may not understand your proposal. So this, because this is something you introduced, you can kind of quickly uh, go over A, what the VOICE Act is and two, why you are trying to implement it in the district. Great, thank you so much, Michael. So the VOICE Act um, essentially would implement a ranked choice voting, also known as instant runoff voting system um, here in the District of Columbia. And what would happen is in a competitive race or competitive election, if no candidate gets 50% of the vote, the candidate who has the lowest number of percentage, um, their votes are reallocated to their second, third, fourth choice, et cetera. Um, and one of the impetuses of um, introducing this was in my particular race, there were 24 people who were seeking um, uh, the seat, which meant that no person was likely to receive 50% of the vote. In fact, I was elected with 15% of the vote. Um, my colleague was elected, I think, with 23% of the vote. So you have a situation where um, you, know, you have candidates who can win with a very, very small number um, of, uh, what do we call it, a uh, mandate, a small mandate <laughs> or a small percentage of the vote um, and then go on to win office. And we feel that ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting would allow for voters to fully exercise their voice and truly feel as though they're selecting a candidate who has support from a broad base um, of voters across the board. Some people have asked why not just do a traditional runoff system and there are a couple of reasons why we didn't choose to do that. Um, number one being the cost, uh, you would have to literally stand up an entirely new election. But two, we know from other jurisdictions that have uh, traditional runoff programs, the turnout for your uh, runoffs is significantly less. So you have a lot more people who, um, yes, I was able to take off work to vote the first time, but now I have to figure out how I'm gonna do work or childcare, et cetera, to do it the second time. Um, and I think we saw that very clearly in um, Georgia. Right. Um, Professor Fuchs, I want to turn to you as uh, a New Yorker who just lived through a mayoral race in the city that uh, the New York Times described as the most high profile experiment in ranked choice voting in the history of the United States. Uh, we only have a few minutes before I want to try to get to some of the audience questions, but uh, can you just give us your thoughts on A, how that system worked in New York? I know you touched on this a little earlier, and what does DC need to consider as it's considering its own model in this? Um, yeah, so it was very exciting. We had, uh, we had the ranked choice voting system implemented <laughs> uh, during a pandemic and we had it for all of our races, all of our local races, city council, as well as the mayor. Um, and, uh, you know, first of all, we had the most diverse field running for mayor ever, which could be attributed to many things. But as I said earlier, uh, uh, Adams, who won in a very closely contested uh, ranked choice voting situation, as, as Council Member Henderson described. And I think it was extremely important for his mandate. So I'll say that in, at, at the beginning, uh, in the front of, of um, in terms of the uh, positive outcome for him. You know, he was able to walk away from this primary. Um, and show that he had over 50% of the support, at least for one and two and maybe even three uh, uh, cho level choices from voters in uh, New York. And in, conversely, it made voters think about who did they wanna, who could they like, who could they support beyond their first choice candidate. It forces the mayoral candidates and the city council candidates 
not to be too negative. We had some negativity, but way less than we might have had. And to actually seek out support from people who might not otherwise, uh, they might not otherwise seek out support from. So the coalitions, which are so important in, in politics now, and in city politics in particular, get formed during the electoral process, uh, during the campaign. And then you can actually look at issues if you're if you want to do that, which a lot of people did and see which of the candidates actually are closest to you, even if you can't get your first choice. And it really did work the way it was supposed to. I just want to give two quick, you know, you know, two quick pieces of data here. 73% of all candidates in our rank choice uh, uh, system were people of color, 43% were women or non-binary, and uh, each race averaged 6.5 candidates, which was, you know, two and a half times what it was in uh, 2017. So we definitely blew the system open in terms of, of that kind of participation. And by the way, we had a lot of public education uh, you know, lots of community-based organizations were engaged with the Campaign Finance Board and with the Board of Elections, and I think it was pretty successful. And the people who opposed it were the people who, like the council member discussed, were the people who wanted to win with 30% of the vote, who really don't have large majorities in their district, but figured out how to game the system with multiple candidates. We've had cases where people put up another candidate with the same name as their opposition to siphon off votes from the opposition. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary how you can game that system uh, when there's either, and we, by the way, dumped the runoff. So you were very wise. Runoffs are expensive and they do, the voter turnout does decline. I personally would have liked a nonpartisan election with the two top vote getters um, running in the general election, regardless of party, that's a heavy lift just, and, and we knew that wasn't gonna happen in New York, the parties don't like that. So this is, RCV ranked choice voting is a miracle in terms of uh, improving uh, representation and engaging people and to, the cherry on the, uh, on the icing on the cake was really increased turnout. And uh, I think that says it all. Thank you. And uh, I think we have our first question coming from uh, Keenan Dogan. I'm going to, is he going to be able to ask on? Yes. Camera? Okay. So sure. So hi, everyone. And I have a question on the topic of ranked choice voting. Um, so the panel has forwarded how ranked choice voting will help district residents better represent their preferences in a candidate field that is becoming increasingly saturated as a result of the fair elections program. But although having donors rank multiple candidates will certainly aggregate donor preferences in a more representative fashion, the sheer volume of candidates a donor now, uh, now must consider means that ranked choice voting alone may not help voters decipher which of these candidates most align with their policy for preferences. So with dozens of candidates running for a seat without partisan labels to help signal their positions, how can the city make it easier for voters to decide which of these candidates to rank given their policy preferences? That's a great question. Chuck, do you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, um, uh, obviously, you know, and, and I'm sure Christina is aware of this, when you have 24 candidates or even seven uh, on a ballot, it's very difficult for voters to, to discern who best reflects their priorities. Um, and, and so with that in mind, I actually am not sure that ranked choice voting gets us there. Uh, or maybe ranked choice voting is what we do in a primary, but that moves us to a general election that's head to head because it's much easier for voters to wrap their heads around what two different candidates are saying uh, and maybe a write in for a, a third. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's really important. And in the district, we have some challenges because we, meaning the city council and the mayor, don't really decide exactly how our elections are administered. Some of it is very complicated and it's written into the home rule document that governs uh, how we elect people and the offices that we elect people to um, and even the party affiliation to a certain extent. So it's not uncomplicated here. But ranked choice voting, for all of the problems and challenges that it addresses, it creates a whole new set 
And there's also voter confidence. A lot of people lack confidence in election results right now uh, for various reasons, some of which are quite nefarious. Regardless, um, when you keep changing the rules, you know, and you see, we change the dates of the primaries for every cycle for a decade. That drives down turnout. That creates confusion. When we keep changing the rules, we keep confusing, confusing voters. We don't do a good uh, uh, job of educating voters about what we're doing. So uh, we may need to slow down. We may need to simplify things uh, before we begin to lose people. Because everyone says, well, RCV and, and um, uh, fair elections have boosted uh, voter participation. That's true, but that's not guaranteed to last forever. And let's keep in mind, the 2020 election cycle in D.C. was an anomaly. It's the first time we ever delivered ballots to every voter in D.C. 2021 was an anomaly in New York as well um, uh, because of the, the mail-in voting options. So when we look at increased turnout, we need to be very careful that we're, that we're not just looking at it through the lens of these past two cycles. Um. Oh. Uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna try to keep it rapid fire here, so we can we can get to as many questions as possible since we we have a hard stop at 11. Uh, I want to get to a question from Tom Sherwood of WAMU's Politics Hour. Uh, he's heard from several candidates that public financing is incredibly difficult when it comes to accounting rules at the Office of Campaign Finance. Uh, is there a way that this system can be simplified? And this one might be a good one for you, uh, Councilmember Henderson. I see you laughing. It is the absolute worst system that we have. And I hope somebody from Office of Campaign Finance is listening. It was horrible and y'all hated it too. Um, so just for folks to know, um, if I were to run as a traditional candidate and when you have to file your um, finance elections report, you would basically upload a spreadsheet of your donors, right? Name, address, where they live, um, where they work, the amount of money you put it into the system. Um, and then you would upload your receipts. For the uh, Fair Elections Program, whoever designed this, um, you have to enter each donation one by one into an online system and then upload a separate PDF that is separate and apart for each donor outlining basically everything that you just entered into the system. So you know how some people will get upset where you apply for a job and they ask you to enter your work history. And then after you enter your work history, then you have to you know, upload your resume and you're like, why did I just do all of that? So I think for, um, I know this was a struggle for, for my campaign in that first um, report. I know that this was likely a struggle for some of my other um, fellow candidates because it is tedious work for no reason whatsoever, because at the end, when they audit your campaign, what they ask for? A single spreadsheet of all of your donors in the very same way that I could have done it before. So I'm with you, Tom. It needs to be simplified. Um, and I, I don't know if it's the interpretation that the Office of Campaign Finance took of the, the bill, um, but they have created, I feel like the worst system possible. And uh, we have an, another question coming in. This may be our last word. Uh, it comes from Nick Stable, who is a recent graduate of the court's MPP program. He asks, are there other electoral reforms that can help to support additional parties that would help voters to differentiate between candidates and the issues they support? Does anyone want to jump in on that one? Michael, I can I can answer sort of quickly. I mean, one alternative to to ranked choice voting is um, right a sort of open primary, and then the top two candidates go on to the general election. Um, that's what's done in Seattle, and it's done in other cities. Right? We have to keep in mind. I mean, what will happen in 2022 in DC is presumably you'll have a mayoral race within the Democratic Party. So uh, whoever wins that primary in June is essentially going to be the mayor in in. But we'll have um, uh, a lot of independents running for the the at-large seat, and that election happens in November, right? And so, so there are sort of two different things happening here. And so some sort of open primary where two candidates go on uh, and the general election, it both helps um, to sort of draw in more candidates, right, to, that, to, to the initial primary. And for voters that um, are sort of not paying attention that much, it ultimately gives them two, two choices to decide. So that's one option. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a very good option. Yeah, I like that also, but you you know, political parties don't like that. Um, we have about 
30 more seconds. If anyone wants to try to squeeze in a last word on ranked choice voting or fair elections. Number one thing, educate the electorate, the board of elections, our elected officials. They've got to get out and explain stuff to the electorate because voter confusion is the worst thing for turnout as well as election results. And don't underestimate your electorate. They can understand ranked choice voting. Yes, we need education, but they're very capable of getting it and it is a game changer. And Emma, I'll say from both New York's experience with ranked choice voting and Seattle's new democracy voucher program, which is now in its third election cycle, um, it really is an education game, getting people to understand this sort of different system that they're not used to. And until it becomes sort of normalized in that community, I think that's really important. Well, I think that's a good time to end. Uh, hopefully this will continue with that education effort. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us. This was a really great discussion, which it could have been a little longer, but I'll see you all next time.